Laura Acasio. Um, and she is a long time oh, and annoyed. was chosen to well, fill the good. Hawaii State Senate seat for District 1 in Hilo, which was vacated by Kai Kahali, who, when he was elected to the United States Congress, she has worked with the Department of Education since 1998, having served as a teacher and a long-term sub in grades K through 12 at 15 different schools across the state. And she serves on the committees on agriculture and environment, Hawaiian affairs, human services, and the Judiciary Committee. So welcome, Senator Acasio. Thank you so, so much. Uh, mahalo. I'm extremely grateful to the League of Women Voters, Hawaii County, for all your work and for uh, to Rosemary Muller and everyone for the invitation to participate today. All those behind the scenes that work to pull events like this together, as well as all of your work increasing civic participation um, and access to the democratic process. Um, I'm truly honored to legislate and join, join you here today with um, my colleague, Rep Capella, from across the chamber, as well as across the island. Um, she's truly an honor and an, it, it's, it's truly an honor and it, she's an inspiration in her tenacity, leadership, enthusiasm, equity, access and justice. Um, and she is a prime example of, of, of what motivates me to continue to, to lead and engage in civics as well. Um, I'm grateful to the Democratic Party officers who, like um, the introduction stated, uh, who entrusted me in the responsibility by voting me one of the three that Governor Ige was able to appoint. And of course, my gratitude goes to Governor Ige for making that decision and giving me this incredible opportunity. Um, I also would just like to thank my family for supporting me in this endeavor. As we all know, um, it takes time away from, from the home and I'm so grateful to my husband and my children for supporting me in this. So I've lived in the district for over 18 years. I feel very rooted in, the, in my relationships um, with both the people of Hilo as well as the incredible special place that it is. Um, I have a background in education as a teacher for the past 20 years and also as a perinatal support professional or birth worker, otherwise known as doula. Um, state legislation uh, is, uh, is based on this need for uh, governance by the people, for the people. And so in that, in that sense, I really feel like I bring a perspective that's vital to moving forward um, as a community member um, an active and avid community member and member of the Democratic Party. I've served on the state central committee since 2016, uh, been an officer in my, in my district as well with the Democratic Party uh, since also since 2016 and have learned um, incredible amounts in terms of the process of engagement. Um, growing up, civic duty was impressed upon us and myself um, and my family were actively involved in the Equal Rights Amendment Movement and many more. Uh, to this day, my family is active in things like immigration reform, voting rights, and a lot of social justice uh, issues um, within, within civic duty. Um, was just impressed upon us uh, that women in politics is really, really important and that it's, a it's not a privilege, it's a right. And I'm grateful to the League of Women Voters for years and years of dedication uh, push, pushing those, um, that agenda. So my husband and I are raising two boys um, who both went to Kayapuni schools, um, uh, Kayapuni school, uh, Kaumeki Kaeo, and are currently at Kamehameha schools. Uh, their dad is uh, from a family of 19 siblings, most of which who were raised in Hilo, uh, but the family is originally from Kau. And my husband is from Nanakuli, Oahu, his parents are both also from Molokai, so roots on Molokai. Um, I've been very involved recently in the reapportionment and re redistricting process, in in, mostly in consideration of speaking for our constituents' need to have fair and adequate representation and voice. Um, I've given multiple testimonies in the need for transparency and openness in the process and asking for them to abide by the Sunshine Laws for boards and commissions. It's very important that we here on, in a rural, in our outer island setting especially, um, get the proper representation 
as um, oftentimes the weight leans heavily towards Oahu. And so I just wanted to be part of that process, learn it, and also um, represent for our community's voice. Uh, I, I did raise some concerns um, about the, the yeah, non-resident, permanent resident extraction, the accuracy of the numbers being extracted and voiced to the commission the need, the real sincere need to follow the law as outlined in Solomon versus Abercrombie. Uh, at any rate, I would just like to say, um, I very much stand for equal access in things of healthcare as a human right, not as a privilege. I support and push, will push legislation to this end, um, as well as educational opportunities around it. I support things like paid family leave, and, um, and much, much more. So as far as um, I would like to get into our 2022 legislative priorities, we have a number of categories and I'll start with good governance because I know that's of importance to the League of Women Voters but it's very much of importance to me. Uh, we are proposing um, legislation to require Zoom in governmental hearings. We noticed that there's a, um, the need to increase accessibility in these governmental proceedings for the public. And during COVID-19, through these interactive conferencing that we're able to have with technologies such as Zoom meetings and YouTube live streaming, especially within the Senate and um, or within the legislative process, it's very important to continue that and to codify that and not let leave it up to simply um, Senate and House rules and leadership to decide whether that continues. Very, very important, especially for those on outer islands or um, with access issues, um, you know, transportation issues or, or other things. I do also, especially once we're able to open uh, the capital to the public, I do believe we also need to include in-person testimony for those who either prefer it or don't have access to computers as well. So that will all be written into it. And if you can support that, that's wonderful. Um, our constituents really express this need and desire to continue. Um, so it'll require the, the interactive conferencing te technology rather than have it be an option. Another one is um, to require um, good standing for state land leases. Um, like any landlord, especially one with fiduciary responsibilities such as the state to its taxpayers, the state should ensure that leases of state lands are in good standing. Uh, with the state in terms of financial, contractual, and legal ob obligations. Uh, currently, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense is not always in good standing because it's underfunded, um, underfunding its impact aid to the state. It's not adequately or expediently remediating in environmental degradation, and it's non-compliant often with certain consent decree or memoranda of agreement. So this bill that I'm proposing will prohibit the state from leasing or extending leases to state lands on any federal, uh, to any federal agency or department that owes money or is in breach of agreements or contracts with the state. Um, so the other one is um, defining public interest for special purpose revenue bonds. So as you know, I'm a fresh woman legislator. So I learned an incredible amount during my first session. And one of the things that we came across, and, and this bill is a result of, is that special purpose revenue bonds, uh, legislation for them, um, were, we were coming across and there's no clear definition of what is in the public interest for the issuance of these revenue bonds. So in deciding whether I would vote for it or against, I really had to dig deeply and find out, well, how do I know what is the special interest? Uh, rather than being relatively arbitrary, um, this would, um, you know, it, it allows broad and vague categories such as creation of jobs to be a singularly sufficient uh, rationale for public interest. And so what the bill would do would define public interest as that which is beneficial to society as a whole, including but not limited to projects that benefit health, safety, and general well welfare of Hawaii's people. Um, and really engage my colleagues in this conversation as of what is for public good. 
Um, okay, so next category is equity and social justice. And I would like to say a uh, really bill that we would love to champion this year and pass through is menstrual equity. Why it's needed? Because 42% of Hawaii public school respondents to a survey put forth by um, Hawaii Stat uh, Commission on the Status of Women said they missed class or left class due to have not having menstrual products. And 22% of our students missed school entirely for this reason. According to the data survey, the survey data, I'm sorry, when Hawaii students don't have access to menstrual products, they use such things as newspapers, old rags, diapers, and even leaves, according to the survey. And that's just heartbreaking. And it also detracts from this equal access to education. So what the bill does is it provides free access to menstrual products in Hawaii public schools, just as a health um, and safety necessity, similar to toilet paper. And, you know, bringing in the, the gender equity piece um, to this is that, you know, we don't think twice necessarily about um, uh, some other, you know, many products such as toilet paper and other sports equipment and, and such to go towards, that generally go towards um, male gender or um, often occupied male genders um, um, activities. And so to really look at that in a, in a, not only a health and education equity, but also a gender equity issue. Uh, I know I have a lot actually. So we have uh, well over probably 45 bills that we're working on. So I've, I've narrowed it down a bit, but another thing under the same, same topic is to require regenerative tourism criteria in all state departments and agencies. So for example, the Hawaii Tourism Authority has prioritized regenerative tourism that takes sustainability one step further and focuses on the net benefits of the visitor economy to a destination, looking at social and cultural benefits uh, for residents and visitors alike. And while providing residents with a voice in tourism development, creating jobs with opportunities for advancement and the need to keep tourism dollars circulated here in the islands. Regenerative tourism is an integral part also of the Hawaii 2050 Sustainability Plan within the Planning Department. Um, it's Act 146. Uh, it provides all of these legal guidelines for all major state and county agencies and activities to convene community government and industry networks to support destination management and increase collaboration in responding to negative tourism impacts in Hawaii's communities. So currently there is no statutory criteria to implement regenerative tourism across the state departments and agencies. And so this bill establishes a criteria for implementing those ideas to all state departments and agencies. Um, another uh, category is economic recovery. Um, I would like, I mean, we, we will be proposing a bill to restore the right to strike for HGEA. So currently, they have binding arbitration requirements in HGEA contracts, which prevent workers from exercising their fundamental rights to control their labor and to collectively organize. Um, basically, this weak, extremely, um, it weakens the union's capacity to fight for themselves. So the bill will restore government employees' right to strike by repealing mandatory arbitration requirements. Next, um, I would also like to propose a bill to limit wage garnishment um, because th the need for this comes out of an individual whose wages are garnished may not have enough money left to pay for things like uh, cost of living expenses such as food, housing, healthcare, and transportation. Of course, this can lead to homelessness, malnourishment, poor health, and becoming a financial burden on the state. And so when we're talking about wage garnishment, you know, from debt or from other, um, other reasons, uh, current statute doesn't have a cost of living allowance um, as do numerous other states. So this bill would add a cost of living expense specific to Hawaii to those calculations of disposable earnings for wage garnishment. Another under the same economic um, recovery is 
Can empty homes find? This is one that I feel like is extremely important in this day and age when we have a housing crisis across the islands and speculation is dramatically um, influencing um, whether folks are able to find housing um, in, a, in, a, in a price range that they can afford. So this empty homes fine, it comes out of the need that many out of state homeowners uh, leave their houses empty because it's used occasionally as a vacation home or simply to hold on to it as a financial investment or asset. And so this creates several problems for our local communities in the state, um, including decreasing the inventory available for homes um, that renters uh, and while increasing rental costs of other houses and decreasing the circulation of money for local businesses and decreasing the potential tax revenue to those local communities as well. So what the bill will do is create a tiered system of financial penalties for houses that are empty for either three to six months and then a separate for six to 12 months with exclusion for homeowners who are hospitalized, um, resolving estate matters, renovating their home or other relevant reasons. But if it's simply empty um, as an asset and then there's a, a tiered system of, of financial um, penalty. Um, this creates, then the idea would, it would create, um, we would create a special fund from the empty homes fine to pay for enforcement and expanding affordable housing options for local residents. Basically as a result, helping to solve some of the issues of housing in our communities. Um, another general um, category is environmental justice. So within all these categories, I'm just giving you a few uh, snippets of, of, of what, we'll, what we're working on. But one is we're working with um, different agencies throughout the state um, to discover about the, limiting, the limit to limit energy dumping. And so what that is, is some of the independent power producers under contract to the utilities shed or dump power, it's called curtailment, um, when the utility doesn't um, need it. And they are not allowed, under, in my understanding, they're not allowed to sell it or transfer it to another utility uh, or um, otherwise be used. It's actually just wasted and dumped. So this is especially true for wind producers, but it also happens with geothermal plants as well. And so limiting this practice helps for a uh, more easily achieve its renewable energy goals. And so what the bill would do is, is um, you know, since power production in Hawaii is regulated by the PUC, this bill would simply require the commission to initiate proceedings that would investigate the issue and make recommendations on how to limit this practice in ways that benefit ratepayers and the environment. Um, our another uh, area is helicopter noise abatement. So our office has received several complaints about from constituents about this, and it would provide the bill would provide incentives for helicopter tours to fly offshore away from primary residences. A huge one that we're working on within our office is extended producer responsibility. So Hawaii's important import dependent economy leads to exceptionally high levels of waste generated per capita. Much of this waste is a result of poor packaging and product design. So there's a growing national trend towards holding producers accountable for the waste generated by businesses, uh, bis by their business models as a way to improve product pack and packaging design and support the development of a circular economy. As this trend builds momentum, Hawaii needs to develop extended producer responsibility programs that are well suited for our needs as a remote island. Uh, we're working with um, national, our office is really engaged in conversation with national organizations on this level that include uh, participate, you know, they're actually driven from Unilever, Mars, Danone, and all of these really major um, uh, players in this, um, uh, you know, um, extended producer, um, they're con they, they contribute to the large amount of what is brought in. So they're really engaged in this conversation and helping us to design what this perhaps looks like. But the bill would require producers to register with the state and pay into a fund. Um, and they would then distribute the money from the fund to Hawaii's counties to cover the cost of waste reduction programs. 
And so essentially it becomes a, a really wonderful pathway to zero waste and, and our reuse programs here within the state. Uh, lastly, well, a few more, but lastly, I do want to um, uh, give time to Rep Capella. Um, so I just touch on a few really important um, bills within agriculture and food security for us. We are working on a subsidy uh, to subsidize the application of organic amendments for coffee crops. So in recent years, the state's created a program that reimburse coffee farmers for the cost of chemicals that they use to combat intru introduced pests. And that poses a serious threat to the, um, the industry. So we would, off, we would like to, um, you know, some, some organic coffee farmers choose not to combat pests by building soil health instead. And so this bill would allow coffee farmers and others who choose to combat pests by building soil and plant health um, to receive reimbursements from the same pool of funding as those who are receiving funding for um, chemical herbicide, pesticide, and, um, and such. Um, we are working on updating Hawaii's dairy industry regulations. Um, the regulations that are currently in place with Department of Health stem from a law passed in 1969 and has not been updated since then. And this is when large scale confined animal feeding operations were the industry standard. And since that time, there's been a boom in small scale boutique dairy operations that allow farmers to manage smaller herds in natural settings and generate greater profits through the production of high quality value added milk products. And um, Hawaii's existing regulations create unnecessary barriers to the development of this type of industry. So we want to modernize Hawaii's industry, dairy industry regulations uh, to facilitate the development of small scale boutique industry to help grow our ag industry here in Hawaii. Um, and then uh, I'll just skip to one last one. I'm skipping quite a few, but I know I'm pressed for time. Um, this is around public safety. And this is um, extremely important in that there's numerous documented, uh, it, it's a duty to intervene requirement for law enforcement. There are numerous documented cases of police officers who abuse citizens with other police officers silently standing by and doing nothing to intervene to stop this abuse. And so what this bill would do is establish a clear criteria for a duty to intervene by police officers and law enforcement when one of their own is behaving inappropriately and abusively, including punitive measures for officers who silently stand by and do nothing. Um, and yeah, mahalo for, for letting me share with you some of those. I know there's probably lots of questions coming through about some of those, and I apologize I had to speed through lots of them. But like I said, there's about at least 45 bills that we're working on, and that's just to give you um, kind of a synopsis of some of the things we're working on. Mahalo for the time. Okay. Thank you, Senator Ocasio. Um, okay, we're going to have our next speaker come on. And um, Representative Capella was born in Kona and raised on a small coffee farm in nearby Captain Cook. She was elected to District 5 in November of 2020. Um, she's also the executive director of Unite Hawaii, an organization dedicated to ending sexual exploitation through education. She serves on the committees for education, culture, culture arts and in international affairs, health, human services, and homelessness higher education and technology. Welcome, Representative Capella. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. What a privilege it is to be here with all of you. Um, I am, today is Saturday, so it's my one and only family day with my little siblings um, on the big island. So I am at the beach um, and my laptop may die, but if it does, I'm just gonna jump on on my phone. So bear with me, I apologize. Um, but my name is Janae Capella. Thank you very much, Rosemary, for the introduction and for having me and asking me to join you folks. I see many familiar faces um, and many faces that I am eager and excited to, uh, to get to know better. Um, I represent District 5 on Hawaii Island, which is Kona and Ka'u. I'm the first woman, Native Hawaiian, and person born and raised in the district to ever represent it in the state house. Um, it is, it has been a privilege, and it has also been a incredible whirlwind journey. Um, there are so many questions that I've already seen in the chat that I want to address. I am definitely not as 
expertly prepared as Senator Ocasio to explain every single one of the bills that I'm introducing. And I will also say that senators get unlimited introductions, um, which representatives, unfortunately, we don't. Um, during the first part of the biennium, so last session, we get uh, 20. And then this next part of the biennium, we can only introduce 10. So very, very limited on what we can introduce and what we get. Um, but I do have a set list of what I'm working on this year, and I'm really excited to share that with you. I do have a number of bills that are still alive from last year. Um, as a woman who was who was born and raised in this district, I also grew up in incredible poverty. I graduated from Konawana High School, um, which is one of the only schools, it's the only high school in the district. Um, so most students that live in the southern half of my district, they're driving an hour and a half to get to school every single day. So as the vice chair of the House Education Committee, I'm working incredibly hard to try and increase access to education, but also in, in rural areas, increasing access to healthcare um, has been key. And I think in COVID, we've really come forward and I think COVID's exposed a lot of the holes and gaps that we see in our systems, both political, in our, um, in our society, in, in our judicial, in our economic system and also in our healthcare system. And it's been very devastating, I think, in more rural communities um, like my own. We have, unfortunately, in Ocean View, some of the lowest COVID vaccination numbers. And I can directly correlate to the, that to the fact that many people out there have no access to healthcare. There's no doctor you can turn to, to say, when we all say, go and talk to your doctor, talk to your medical professional, talk to someone that you, you trust, there's no one to trust because there is no doctor. Um, so increasing access to quality health care, but also to reproductive rights. That's one of the other things that we've seen across our country. Women's rights are under attack. And um, this, this past year, I think we've also seen, thankfully, um, the Planned Parenthood, a lot of their money was restored, the state budget. But in the beginning, when Trump was our, was our president, unfortunately, um, a lot of that money was stripped away. So even here in Hawaii, where we are one of the most pro-choice states in the entire country, we've seen our issues and we have a lot to defend here as well. Um, so increasing access to that in this past year, we passed House Bill 57, um, uh, five, 576, excuse me, um, which turned into Act 57, um, but increasing access so advanced practice registered nurses could perform abortion services, which is key here um, on Hawaii Island and in rural areas. Um, but I'm inc incredibly excited for next legislative session because it is an election year. Um, I think that we have a lot more precedence to try and push some of the um, hard standing legislators that don't necessarily wanna move on certain things, especially when you're talking about um, racial justice or um, economic, economic justice, minimum wage, increasing our minimum wage, um, adding and ensuring that every single person has paid sick leave in the era of coronavirus, which we couldn't even get a hearing for in the house. Um, but these are some of the things that my office introduced last year, which was the minimum wage bill increasing to $17 an hour. And it was a six, um, six, six year, six step process to get there. Um, and I do plan on introducing that again, even though it is still alive technically in the house. Um, but we also introduced a family leave bill so that um, families who have kiki or kupuna can take care, can take the time off that they need and deserve um, in order to care for their loved ones. Um, introducing paid sick leave, that's still alive. Um, we're gonna keep pushing for that. Um, one thing that we're also going to push for this this year, I'm excited to introduce this, and I'm working with the um, ILWU along with the what is their new union? Um, there's a there's a new ILWU is working with a, a number of uh, unions, labor organizations to 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 try and um, work together to fight for more of the legislative pieces that uh, relate to workers' rights. But we are working with them on a. Um, UI tax exemption. So ensuring that unemployment insurance is not taxed. Um, many people this past year, so much of our society and so many of our constituents were put on unemployment. And unfortunately, when tax time came around, so many people couldn't afford to pay their taxes. So I think in order to, when someone has to go on unemployment because they don't have a job, then to tell them that they have to owe taxes on that money, I think that's really, really disgusting. Um, and I think it's vile of us to do something like that. So we are working on a bill to exempt unemployment insurance. Um, and I'm really excited about that. Um, and then 
We are also going to do something on regenerative tourism. I'm so glad that Senator Ocasio brought that up. I think that there's a lot of precedence for that. HTA and their new leadership has really been kind of pushing that line. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get their support on something like that. Um, I am a big proponent of green fees. I did introduce the, um, a bill on that last year. And we're trying, to, we're trying to find a way to bring something like that in again this year. Um, uh, as someone who represents the coffee belt here in Kona, um, we're doing the CBB program. So we're adding in fertilizer because fertilizer, unfortunately, was not an option this past year in the bill. At the last minute, it was taken out. So for organic farmers, which um, Senator Ocasio and I actually had the opportunity to come and visit a number of them, they were kind of cut out. And we all know that the fertilizer is what is so necessary in order to keep the trees healthy um, so that we don't have to use some sort of pesticide, which would then take away the organic certification from many of these um, artisanal farmers. Um, we're doing something on rent control and affordable housing. One of the biggest issues that comes up when we talk about affordable housing is, well, there's just no housing. But the other portion of it is that when we talk about affordable housing, our state's definition is 80 to 150% area media income. In order to make that, you're, you have to be making somewhere near just under $100,000 a year. As a state legislator, I don't make anywhere near that. And I have a stable job. So if I can't even afford, afford, if I can't qualify for affordable housing, there's no way that someone who is making $10.10 an hour at minimum wage can afford affordable housing. So we really need to adjust what our state's definition of affordable housing is. So working with HHFDC on that, something that my office is trying to prioritize. Um, because we have the 10 slot limit, there are a number of things that we're trying to do through caucuses. Um, through the Hawaiian caucus, we are really trying to work on the pro rata share and ensuring that Native Hawaiians get their fair share of the pro rata share. Unfortunately, right now, um, constitutionally, Native Hawaiians are owed 20% of the pro rata share or money that's made off of um, crown lands or state lands. And unfortunately, Native Hawaiians get less than 3%. So this is all money that could be going towards OHA, towards DHHL to address the wait list, to build affordable housing. Um, it's money that's very, very needed. So we're working on that. Um, my goal is to start an education caucus so that we can have really a more robust conversation on public education. It's one of the biggest reasons why I ran. Um, and as someone who went to public school, as someone who wants to send, hopefully if I have children, <laughs> if I'm not too busy doing the job, um, it is to be able to send them to a public school as well and have them get the quality education that they deserve. Um, because I don't believe that our leaders have to come from private schools or from somewhere else. I think that our leaders need to be grown right in our own communities and in our own districts because every district is so unique and individual um, and it deserves leadership that comes from within. And we need to, we need to deserve, and our students deserve schools that help teach them and help grow them um, into the leaders that we deserve. So we are trying to work on, address, on addressing class size. Um, we're working on uh, special education um, funding allocations so that more SPED students get the funding that they deserve. Um, we're working on trying to get a teacher on the BOE. We got pretty close this last year. Um, so I'm going to introduce that again and hopefully hopefully we'll get it there. Um, it's, it's really absurd that I think a teacher is not on the Board of Education. Um, we're working on authentic assessments, trying to localize what our students are being taught and stop um, really just this push of insane standardized testing and the fact that so many of our schools are funded by these standardized tests means that teachers 80% of the year even more are teaching to a textbook just so that their students can pass this standardized test and they're not learning anything and it's not as we learned through COVID this past um the past couple of years the past year we've learned that students um have had these curriculum that are not aligned with Hawaii, not aligned with um, anything that's authentic to this state or this place. It's not place-based learning. Um, and in many cases, it's incredibly racist and scientifically inaccurate. So really trying to shift that focus so that teachers who are so qualified um, can get the pay that they deserve, which is what they deserve. And my, my office has been working on that, but also ensuring that they are able to, to do what they, what they love which is teach and educate and not have to teach from a textbook, but to teach from the knowledge that they have and the things that um, they know their students will grow and learn from, which a standardized test can't teach a student. Um, racial justice in education is another thing that we're working on. And I, I, I think there was someone in this group um, that may have been on one of my uh, task force meetings, but my office has been holding a task force um, on campus safety. 
So addressing campus safety issues on UH campuses um, has been a really big problem. Uh, so my office is trying to work on that. Um, and then I'm working on a number of things for anti-trafficking efforts, um, decriminalization by half, a more of like a, a, a bodies back um, type of bill and piece of legislation to really just protect women. Um, working on anti-trafficking education so that students who oftentimes are the targets of traffickers have the education to protect themselves um, and teachers and school staff have the knowledge on how to protect, how to best protect their students. Um, and then another school um, piece of legislation that we're trying to work on is free breakfast for all students. This past year through a grant federally, um, we were able to provide free meals to students, um, but it's a one year program and unless it continues, which we don't know, I'd like to try and see if we can push for something in our state law because it's very possible for us to do that. Um, and then a emergency shelter authorization for sex trafficked minors. Um, unfortunately, this past year, HLAC, um, which is the state's only sh short term, like a drop in space for survivors of human traffic, human trafficking was closed due to a financial mix up and issue. Um, and thankfully through county funding in Honolulu, they were able to reopen. Um, but one of the main survivors who led the shelter um, ended up leaving and working for a new organization. So if we can get solid funding for organizations, um, for state funded facilities that actually protect young women, um, and, and young men as well, but protect these individuals from harm. I think that, that would be fantastic. So those are, those are a handful of the things that um, my office is working on, but I'm just excited to get the opportunity to talk with you folks to see, I think really what you folks wanna work on, how I can best support that um, and how we can work together uh, to, to move, I think the common good forward. So that I, I talk really fast, by the way. Uh, so I do apologize. I kind of threw it all at you, <laughs> um, but there, it's 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 hard not to be excited about change. <laughs> Thank you so much, Representative Capallo. I'm going to turn the um, back over to um, Helen, and um, I believe Michelle maybe has the list of the chat questions. Um, that they can go through. So um, thank you both speakers very much for your engaging and informative presentations. Helen? Okay. You, you're still muted. Oh, there you are. Okay. Would you like to lead the discussion on questions, Rosemary, for Senator uh, Acasio from... Uh, I don't, what, I didn't, what, I didn't. What physical or political barriers exist with respect to increasing governmental accessibility vis-a-vis -vis Zoom, government hearings, and how do you suggest we adjust, address these? That, that is an excellent, excellent question. Um, I think uh, Rep Capella touched on some of that in, in mentioning about uh, you know, the leadership and, and powers that be that perhaps aren't served by transparency and openness um, in legislation are often those who are, um, have been in their positions for quite some time. And, and you know, the barriers to some of that in terms of um, having the bill heard is real. And that is the nature of all of some of this. And so, one of the things I'd really like to push, and I think every, I'm probably very much speaking to the choir, is that 2022 is an election year for all of us. And so it is, in, it is just immeasurably important uh, to, to choose representatives that believe in transparency, believe in the fundamentals of democracy and Put, are, are willing to, as someone, um, let's see, Susan said in the, in the comments, uh, swimming against the tide in, in some ways, in some fashions, um, and, and maintain the integrity of, of why they're there as representatives um, for, for this purpose. And so that's one of the major things. Um, as far as financial barriers, I know for the state legislation, as well as boards and commissions currently, uh, we're, we're doing it because of COVID. And so it's, we've, 
proven that it's possible. There was very few hangups. I believe in the Senate, there was one hearing that had a technical glitch and that needed to be continued the next day out of you know, hundreds and hundreds of hearings. So um, that accessibility is there. I think part of the, potentially for the financial barriers um, that we could um, focus on would be creating little hubs, maybe even in communities. Again, so especially so that while the Capitol is closed to the public, those who don't have access to computers and technology can go to a place, not, not necessarily the library or maybe within our library system, um, and I think right now there's a barrier to the library in that you have to be vaccinated or take a test. And so that creates a huge additional barrier um, that I think is, is fundamentally uh, opposed to our democratic process. And so that would need to be addressed as well. But um, that is under emergency orders. And so it's at this point, it's, it's un, up to the governor. Um, as we move forward, though, and emerge out of or emerge into our new ongoings. And once, especially once the emergency declarations and we will have uh, the ability to create some of those systems. So I think it's vitally important um, to, to democracy and to engaging more folks in the educational process as well as the, the um, legislative process. Thank you. Uh, now we'll ask a question for um, Representative Bella. What are your plans to help Ocean View get water and emergency shelter and at least one school here in Ocean View? Thank you for that question. Um, Ocean View has spent a lot of time on my heart and I've been spending a lot of time in that part of the district. Um, it's so difficult. And I think part of my biggest issue is, and part of the issue that I'm really facing, I think as a, as a state legislator, is that so many people in the state don't understand, in, that are my colleagues, don't understand um, how rural Ocean View is. They also don't understand, um, I think in some portions of it, the level of poverty and the, disconnection, I think, from the rest of, um, from the rest of our state. And I've really struggled to get people to understand the way of life in Ocean View and the way that so many of my constituents are really, really struggling. Anyone who lives in Ocean View is one of the most resilient human beings I have ever met. Um, from, and, and I've talked about this in, in, during my, my time, um, but one of the things that I'm trying to get um, many of my colleagues to do is, is to come and visit and to see why we need to prioritize certain parts of our state over others, because there are certain constituencies like my own in Ocean View that we need so much assistance that, um, that if you just come and visit, I think that there's no way you can't prioritize um, building in Ocean View. So I have been in contact, with that said, I have been in contact with um, the, the Board of Water Supply. We've, I've, I am setting, I set up a meeting to go and see the current water well in Ocean View. One of the issues is that there's, it's, I've been told that when they, dug too, when they dug down, they dug too deep and they hit salt and that's not it. The, the issue is that when they dug the quality of water in Ocean View, there's just not enough. So when you pull from that water well, no matter what you're pulling up the sediment from, um, from the top because the sediment sits on the top of the, this is the well. Um, this is some of the, the fresh water that can be pulled. Um, the sediment is sits on top. So there's just not enough water in the well because there's just not enough water in that area um, to be pulled up. So uh, we have talked about doing a second well closer to Waiohino. Um, the issue is that to pump water from Waiohino, you'd have to pump up and over and around and then into Ocean View. Um, and there's no pump that I think could be large enough. Is this what I have been explained to me? Um, there's no pump that's large enough that could be pulled into um, Ocean View. So that's one of the issues. Um, so I think we need to begin looking creatively um, on how to address the water issue uh, in Ocean View. Um, but it is something that my office has been working on. Um, second, a school. 
it has been one of my biggest priorities to try and get a school in Ocean View, especially because I know that there are so many young families that are moving into Ocean View. Um, so I think the first step is to at least provide more bus access, which I know has been, a, which I already know has been a really big issue, but that's one of the things that we're addressing. So at least we can, while we focus on trying to get a school out there, we can at least get students to school and home um, through through the school bus system, which has been an issue, um, but we are trying to work with some of the, some of the county, um, like the Heleon to provide free bus passes for students so that they can get to school and back because the school bus system, we just don't have enough school bus drivers. Also, if you know anyone that is looking for a job, uh, the county is offering a $1,000 um, sign-on bonus for anyone who wants to be a school driver because um, school bus driver, because we don't have enough school bus um, drivers. And then secondly, I've been working with the West Hawaii Community Health Center. I know that they just merged with Bay Clinic, um, talking about uh, healthcare. Um, but one of the things, my big, one of my top priorities um, being in office is to build a healthcare center in Ocean View so that we have nothing really from Bay, Bay Clinic, which isn't always open, but really the hospital in Kau, all the way into Kona Community Hospital. So building a healthcare center um, where we can implement more of the like everyday practices that like an everyday doctor, a dentist, um, a Native Hawaiian healthcare practitioner, all of these different things can be put in. Um, and this was actually done in, uh, in Waianae on the west, the west side of Oahu. Um, or, and uh, they have this beautiful healthcare clinic. And I think that that's something that we could replicate and bring to Ocean View. And I think that, that would be a really phenomenal thing. So that's one of the things that I'm really trying to prioritize is access to healthcare because healthcare is a right. Um, that was a long winded answer. I apologize. Um, but there's, there's a lot to do in Ocean View and there's a lot of things to work on and a lot of different, different ways that I think that we need to be creative and work together because it's not just going to be one person that can fix it. I don't have a magic wand. Um, but I want to be a bridge to really help bring the community together so that we can fix the issues um, in that part of the district. Thank you. Um, we have a little bit of time left, so we'll get short answers to these meaningful questions. I have one more for Senator. On the issue of regenerative tourism, are there any provisions in the proveil, proposed bill that provide for a mandatory stakeholder community consultations whose input will be duly reflected in the proposed legislation. Did you hear that question, Senator? Oh, un okay, you're unmuted now. Yeah. So, absolutely. So, um, as I had said earlier, um, you know, part of the sustainability um, 2050 um, guidelines uh, mandate uh, community input and involvement. And so again, the purpose would be to codify that because it's, it, you know, there are recommendations and there um, they're a way, it, which all of that is actually built on statute. All of the, um, the recommendations coming from the state planning office is, is, is built upon statute. However, again, we need to make sure that then the departments and agencies and organizations involved also need to implement that. And so it, it, it's linking that together, but, but absolutely, um, as part of this regenerative tourism model, community input is vital. Um, cultural input is vital. And, and that, that, again, it goes back to democracy in, in the sense of what happens in our islands is based on the needs of the people. And so that's critical. I can go on about that quite a while, but I'll stop. All right, thank you. Uh, we have another question for the representative. Can the legislature address some of the structural barriers to nursing training in Hawaii? Yes. Um, to my knowledge, I believe that the legislature can. Um, and I, as a, as a member of the Health, Homelessness, and Human Services Committee, that's something that I'll bring up with the chair uh, so that we can begin to work on that. Uh, I think one of the other, we have a, a nursing shortage, we have a teacher shortage, we have a doctor shortage. One of the biggest issues with the doctor shortage is the fact that doctors make 60 cents to the dollar that they would make anywhere else. And then on top of that, we have this incredibly high cost of living and a lack of housing. So I think if we can address the housing 
crisis that we have here in our state, then we'll actually be able to address a lot of these other issues, like the lack of the lack of qualified teachers, the lack of doctors, and then also the lack of nurses. Um, but I know that UH has also been working um, very closely, I think, with both teachers and with uh, nurses to try and um, to try and grow more of um, these nurses and teachers here within our own state. Um, so those are some of the things that I can that I can check on and work on, um, and that I'm excited to work on. Thank you. Given the time, it's almost eleven o'clock. Um, I'm going to ask Rosemary to make sure that she emails us all, if you don't mind, the members and um, directors and others' addresses for both um, our senator and representative. So if the questions weren't answered now, you could contact of them directly. Can you do that, Rosemary? And will that work for both you, uh, Senator Acasio and Representative Capella? Did I pronounce your names correctly? Great. Um, I can do that. Yes. And then there is um, an email I'd like to share, which is from, uh, it's basically uh, a thank you from, to say thanks to both Senator and Acacia, Representative Capella for their votes on SB 404 and against the override of that bill by the governor seriously degrades the depressed transparency of certain campaign finance expenditures. The public needs to know who spends what for whom. Thank you for swimming against the tide, not easily. So you really, we really do appreciate the work that you both are doing. And we really, really do appreciate your coming to the Zoom meeting today. Frankly, um, there may be others a lot more informed might be, but I certainly have learned a lot and I really appreciate your being here today. So thank you very, very much.